Hi, everybody, and thank you for being on, on this um, Zoom slash online chat about Ross Perlin's new book, Language City. I'm Atusa Abrahamian, uh, your moderator, um, and I've known Ross for quite some time, and I'm so thrilled to be talking about this book because since I finished reading it, I cannot shut up about it. Um, it's a remarkable book. Just, I mean, the scales fell from my eyes. I've been living in New York City for 20 years. I speak a bunch of languages. I think of myself as a reasonably cosmopolitan person, and I just had no idea that all of these very small, very endangered languages were hiding literally blocks from, from my house, from where I used to work. Um, it's incredible. I mean, if you read the, uh, there's six sections, each talks about an endangered language. And uh, what you end up with is a kind of kaleidoscopic vision of New York um, that I think that nobody has seen before. So thank you so much, Ross, for writing writing this marvelous book. Uh, it's also very immersive and fun to read and the linguistic bits are not too boring, I assure you. Um, and that's all thanks to Ross's years and years and years of field work and activism and uh, reportage. Uh, so Ross, thanks again for being here. Um, can you say a few words about how this book came about? Well, thanks so much, Dusa. Thank you for doing this with me. It's 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 really exciting to have this discussion with you. I feel like your your work on the the cracks in the nation state system globally, as you as you put it, uh, is kind of a real a really complementary with the things that I'm interested in and talking about. Uh, in terms of you know how languages, the world's seven thousand plus languages fit into the sort of approximately two hundred nation states. Uh, there's obviously an mismatch there that I'm, I think we'll get into. Uh, would also like to just quickly thank New America and everyone at New America. Uh, that's you know Oista, Sarah, and Armada in particular who helped make this event possible, and the New America Fellowship, which uh, I guess you're you're now on, right? Atisa and I was on this past year, which um, really gave me the space and the community to 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 bring this book out to to finish it and to um uh you know it just came out two weeks ago so I'm I'm super grateful to New America for providing the platform, the space, the intellectual community, and hopefully also a, a sort of a, a dimension closer to the world of policy and politics as well. Uh because this is both a book about languages and a book about cities. So in terms of the genesis of it, um it's been over a decade in in the making, I um, over a decade ago was finishing up a, a, my my PhD in linguistics. At the same time, I had also written this book called Internation, which was about uh, unpaid labor and and had a had a more sort of political charge, very different from my linguistic work. But um, but my primary interest through all these years had been in language endangerment and the documentation of endangered languages, and linguistic diversity, and the future of you know, the world's 7,000 plus languages of which over half really are considered endangered by by most linguists in a sort of an unprecedented degree of crisis that's happening right now. And so initially my approach to that had been to do sort of quote unquote traditional linguistic field work in Southwest China and Eastern Himalaya, the most linguistically diverse part of China in the Southwest. This is where I became interested in, in these issues, got to know about them through uh, especially a Chinese linguist named Sun Hongkai, who was sort of a legendary figure who I talk a little about in the book. Uh, so I was doing that work there, which was sort of, you know, be, being in a distant mountainous region, uh, you know, given having been born and raised in New York, this was 7,000 miles from home, and uh, working on a dictionary and a grammar and a set of recordings for this language, Turung, spoken in one particular valley. And then I came home to, to New York after several years of doing that work. The Endangered Language Alliance had just been established as this kind of new organization the, for the first time looking at urban linguistic diversity in this way by a group of linguists, language activists, speakers, artists, uh, sort of understanding that cities, of course, have always been linguistically diverse and New York as a paradigm case of that in many ways, but that there had been an acceleration in that in just the last few decades with urbanization, right, the world's population now being majority urban, sort of breakneck urbanization going on everywhere, but also the arrival of speakers of indigenous, endangered, minority, and primarily oral languages in particular, their arrival into cities. Uh, again, not just New York, but New York as sort of a paradigm case, like a, a, a gateway of immigration now going back centuries. Um, but the, what had happened, especially after 1965, the Immigration Act, maybe we'll talk a little bit about the sort of the ups and downs of immigration, 
but had really sort of in, in some ways, even perhaps a little inadvertently, opened the doors of the US and New York to an unprecedented degree of linguistic diversity that hadn't really been recognized. And that this was happening at a moment when more and more of the world's languages are, are in danger, that their speakers are arriving in New York, which then becomes a kind of strange last minute haven or, or last minute babble uh, where the languages are, but they're they're invisible largely to those or inaudible to those who are not the speakers or in the communities, let alone policymakers or the census. And so this became the work of the Endangered Language Alliance, the organization which I've co-directed for the past decade. And the book is at once a linguistic history of New York and a portrait, a linguistic portrait of a city, which is something I hadn't seen done and wanted to do to sort of paint the, uh, a city in all of its languages, not just the sort of major ones that, that people know about. And of course, you know, there are a dozen languages in New York with over 100,000 speakers that are major and we do talk about those part of the linguistic history but to recognize actually that sort of the secret sauce of the city's history is in its uh its lesser known peoples and that the lens of language really sort of gets beneath the sort of nation state idea to let us see specifically where people are coming from and what the actual flows are uh so it's it's that linguistic history and then it's the portraits of six speakers that we've been working with for years through through the endangered language alliance that i've, I've known well and I, I talk about each case their community their story how they're approaching this question of uh of preserving or developing their endangered mother tongues and then some ideas engines about the future and the policy implications and where things might go from here so the structure is sort of past present and future yeah, something I found, and we'll, I think, you, I hope that you tell us a bit more about each person that you spent years following, um, because it sounds like you developed some, some very substantial relationships with these um, kind of keepers of, of endangered languages. Um, but um, I do want to go back to something you hinted at here, which is that the nation state is not such a big, does not play such a big role um, in your book at all. In fact, and I, and this, I mean, this as a compliment. Sometimes when you're on your field work, I, I stopped myself and I said, wait, where, what country are we in? And then I realized the whole point is that we're, it doesn't really matter um, because there's been this kind of deterritorialization and then re-territorialization of these languages um, in our wonderful city of New York. Uh, and I was hoping you could say a few words about the sort of topography or or this kind of wh where people land and what it looks like, because you have, you know, a whole village in an, in, a, in an apartment building. You have little pockets of languages here and there. Um, what is the topography of, of this linguistic landscape look like? Yeah, the nation state can be a distraction here in some ways. And uh, as I said, you know, over 7000 languages, which really you, there's no sort of birth date to a language. Languages are, are the result usually of continuous processes that fetch back really thousands of years. I mean, there are occasionally moments when you can say a language coalesces as a sort of named entity, but really what we're talking about are much more sort of uh, gradual generational developments that have happened in particular localities, adapting to particular environmental niches, uh, really going back thousands of years as, as historical linguistics sort of traces these language families and language families famously are not, you know, really political entities, although sometimes they're, they're harnessed as such, but they really cut uh, across a different kind of history. Uh, and, you know, nation states, of course, are mostly just a century or so old, most of the, the 200 or approximately 200 nation states we have. And most of them have this kind of ideology that they have, uh, you know, inherited in a which is that they're going to promote one or just a few standard languages and that they're going to do that with education systems and language policy and, and so on that really kind of constrain linguistic diversity and generally don't know what to do with, you know, the fact that in most cases they, they, they have, you know, dozens, if not hundreds of languages on their territory, which represent these much older forms of belonging and much more local types of identity uh, that are that are quite complex and are again primarily oral because that's been what people have needed in most cases. Uh, so you know it's uh, it's there's really a sort of a mismatch here and I really think to understand who's coming, you know as, as I say at one point you know some of the the oldest immigrants Lenape is the original language of the territory and we'll talk about that that's New York's indigenous language and uh, of the surrounding area and, and today highly endangered to the point of having a single speaker, essentially a single native speaker who's now in Canada through the waves of displacement that have happened and expulsion. Uh, 
Uh, and this is not uncommon for for a, a Native American language of which there were you know some three hundred north of the Rio Grande at the time of uh, European colonization, uh, with the vast majority today either lost or endangered, and uh, and yet remarkable revitalization work going on, including with Lenape. But from there, starting exactly four hundred years ago with colonization uh, and the settlement of the the Dutch, sort of establishing at first also this. Now, it wasn't exactly a Dutch New Amsterdam. It was a it was a Dutch West India Company entrepot, a trading space, uh, perhaps not unlike the ones that 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 you describe it. So in a way, these sort of deterritorialized zones, and you know the Dutch government sort of became involved at, at certain points, but really it was this kind of strange corporate entity that was then highly multilingual, and and some eighteen languages were already spoken by the first sort of four hundred people who came. And most were not Dutch speakers. They were speakers of all kinds of different things, including the first permanent settlers who came 400 years ago were Walloon speakers from what's now the French-Belgian border. But it's not, it wasn't France, it wasn't Belgium, but Walloon speakers. Uh, people like Peter Stuyvesant, he was a Frisian speaker. They were Flemish speakers. These are all minority languages at the time. And today the newest arrivals are, are really not, you know, best described as, you know, from China or from Guinea, but speakers of Fujianese or Fulani, and, and those actually, that gets at where people are really coming from. Yeah. And then that also explains what happens when people arrive here, to your question about settlement patterns. Um, and, you know, that it really doesn't make sense, or it's not really kind of what's going on to say, oh, this is just you know, Chinatown, or this is little, little Guinea, or little, you know, uh, because actually what's happening is that whole kind of regions of the world uh, are, 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 are Sort of seen in microcosm now in parts of uh, in parts of especially the outer boroughs of New York. And again, it's true of other cities as well. But people are settling in in particular patterns that are of course determined also by work and by the cost mm -hmm. of housing and a bunch of other things. But also very much by sort of linguistic and cultural connections uh, and particular sort of flows. As you mentioned, the case of, of Seke, one of the one of the languages I talk about, seven hundred speakers in the world at most, uh, coming originally from five villages of Nepal. To call them Nepali would not be quite right. They were traditionally, they're right up on the border with Tibet, really now the sort of China controlled areas of Tibet. Uh, and there are several distinctive languages coming from there. It was actually an independent principality for a long time within which Seke speakers in their five villages were themselves already a kind of minority. Uh, and now they've come to Brooklyn and Queens, especially Brooklyn, where there's you know, one vertical village in particular where well over 100 of those 700 speakers have, have come to and are, are living. And that's a major space for the language, really a sixth village. So those kinds of flows, which I think are much more common than we understand, actually sort of make up the bedrock of the immigrant city and actually tell us much more about uh, what migration is, the translocal, not just transnational, but really translocal connections that bind places, a particular village in Puebla in Mexico to a particular block or neighborhood in the Bronx. I think that's a lot of what's really going on and, uh, in terms of, you know, the, the, the actual way that life is shaped and the power of remittances. And, uh, you know, it's really about those kinds of connections that make immigration tick and make a city tick and to sort of just say, oh, there's, you know, been a huge uh, wave of Mexican migration to New York since the 1990s that's brought, you know, new people or whatever, misses the fact that, well, over three quarters of them are from a few particular states in southern Mexico. That's quite different from L.A. or Chicago or elsewhere. It also means that it's a heavily indigenous migration, speaking well over a dozen different languages. So, you know, these are the kinds of things that I hope the book opens up. Yeah, for sure. And, it, you know, anyone who lives in New York has had an experience where you notice, oh, all the all the cobblers seem to be, uh, you Bukharian. know, right, Bukharian or um, I was getting my hair cut a couple, I go to a place down the street where to get my hair cut and the, um, the barbers and, the, and there's one female hairdresser are all, they're, I, they're from Tajikistan, right? But that doesn't mean a whole lot because they're Jews who speak Persian and Russian about as fluently as anything else. And so right. it's a funny, it's a funny mix because even they will not say oh, we're from Tajikistan, um, because that's not how they identify um so yeah right. language gets you into a deeper and then we're not even talking about people are often like oh dialect or language actually getting yeah getting the deeper you get into where somebody is actually um what they actually speak uh and there's i think a strong over representation always of, of of religious linguistic uh ethnic and other minorities you know that that are that are motivated to migrate uh 
in any case, and then, and then sort of establish communities elsewhere, and then the dynamics of diaspora that result from that, uh, these sort of, it's not representative, it's not majoritarian communities, it's actually the sort of, uh, uh, this question, I guess, also of the, di the diasporization of everyone is also an interesting question. What does it mean for so many groups to be in diaspora and then a place like New York to be a capital of diasporas? Yeah, when I was reading your book, it occurred to me that you could have written a par you could have written a sort of parallel narrative um, of this of this language focused book by just talking about the food and the food comes up in every almost every chapter. Um, it made me very hungry personally. <laughs> Um, and so you also, it sounds like you ate your way around New York City as much as you listened and talked your way around. The food is important and it's a good way, it's a good way in, uh, but there are also very serious parallels, I think, between food and, and, and language here, obviously, and yeah. culture too. Uh, so food comes up in a number of different ways. Uh, one way, when related to what you were just talking about with the cobblers and the barbers, uh, is this question of occupational niches, how people work. The labor markets that are based on these immigrant patterns. Uh, because just as people are flowing from particular places to particular areas of New York and other cities, they're also finding their way into particular occupations, particular niches, uh, whether it's barbers or cobblers. So just within the world of food service, uh, there are so many of these kinds of niches. And, uh, and again, this is so much of in understanding this sort of the, both the immigrant contribution to the revitalization of American cities, understanding labor markets. These might not be exactly kind of fair official labor practices. In some cases, they, they might be you know, a reflection of, of really exploitative hierarchies, depending on where people are coming from. It's obviously about sort of where people can get a foothold, what jobs they can get when there are language barriers, when they may not be documented and so on. Uh, but just within food service, I mean, an extraordinary one of these niches that I talk a little about uh, that I think has a lot of importance is that of the, the deliveristas. Uh, the delivery workers in New York, who just in the last 10 years have become a sort of major force. Many are from Mexico and Guatemala. They were essential workers in the, the time, you know, the, the height of the pandemic. Um, many are indigenous, heavily indigenous speakers of Mayan languages from Guatemala, so Pisteco and Tlapaneco and other languages from Mexico. And, you know, that fact has also then enabled a certain mobilization, just as the use of Yiddish or Sicilian enabled a certain mobilization among garment workers a century ago. Um, it's a part of the story of union, unions, it's part of the story of labor. Um, and, uh, you know, just within the world of food, there are the deliveristas, of course, there are the famous you know, Greek diners, but now it's, 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 it might be the, you know, more about the Mexican diners or more about the, the uh, uh, you know, Albanian pizza places instead of the Italian pizza places. And these things are always kind of shifting and changing. Uh, so I would definitely recommend sort of eating your way through the book. I, I wish there should be a sort of like tasting notes pairing menu uh, you could... because it also has to do with the history of foods. Yeah. This, this would be an idea. We should, we should do it. I mean, there, so there is a language map of New York that kind of should be in some ways a companion of the book. It's talked about in the book. It's something that we worked on for many years at the Endangered Language Alliance and that was part of all of the research for this. Uh, there's a, both a print version, which is for, for, for donation to, to, to the ELA, but also a free digital version at languagemap.nyc. And uh, this shows the over 700 plus languages, which we've documented as being in New York, it tells their stories, it shows the recordings, uh, and it's very kind of integrally tied to the book. And I think we should have a sort of uh, food overlay. Uh, and, you know, this idea that, of course, the way and other places show restaurants, you know, just here's a a Senegalese restaurant, or here's an Italian restaurant, here's a Ghanaian restaurant, they put it in terms of national categories. Uh, and the idea of a cuisine, I compare at one point to the idea of a national language, this idea that there's some sort of standardized thing which can be sort of put to a language. Of course, nations want to promote that. Some actively do promote that. For instance, the Thai government, I understand, has been instrumental in promoting the opening of Thai restaurants. But if you actually get under the hood of most of the dishes and most of what people are cooking and what's happening, as with language, there are much more sort of local articulations and recipes that are in play. At the same time, as many of the ingredients have been flowing sort of globally or regionally, of course, you know, whether it's, you know, how tomatoes, where tomato went from right. Nahuatl, one of the languages I talk about in the book, you know, and became an integral part of Italian cuisine to a point where we can't imagine it without it. Uh, so the ingredients may flow, which is not unlike language, how things do sort of pass you know, pass globally. We're not talking about totally isolated languages here, uh, but then they become very locally articulated. And it's that sort of, that patterning that I try to get at. And the nation 
would say there's almost this kind of, I don't know, awkward category in the middle that now tries to take credit for everything. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the languages, many were new to me, um, partly because they're very small. And uh, the most, to me, the most fascinating chapter was uh, was was about um, Wahi. Um, can you tell me a little bit, there was an incident that was just amazing um, because you spend time in New York, but you also do field work. And just tell us about the DVD in the Tajik, Tajik Highlands. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The Pamir Mountain region of Tajikistan. Uh, yeah. This was one of those moments where I think the kind of flows back and forth uh, of, of ideas and languages and recordings, kind of the, the Ouroboros sort of was biting its own tail. Um, so, you know, in this, in this section of the six speakers, we've touched on a few of them. Um, this is, you know, it's, it's about a woman named Husniya who is a uh, highly multilingual, kind of a classic example of a multilingual New Yorker, uh, you know, who, who came from Tajikistan a little over a decade ago, um, speaks, you know, nine languages, at least kind of depending on how one wants to, to count. And, uh, you know, and again, this is not totally uncommon. York and in other cities um, where half the population speaks a language other than English at home, but then many people are speakers of three, four, five, and more languages like Uotoso, but you know, different languages, of course. Uh, and you know, in her case, she's born in this in this particular area of Tajikistan, actually with a lot of Kyrgyz neighbors, but then it, it's it's an area that's religiously distinct because they're Ismaili Muslims, uh, who are distinct from their, their it's kind of seen as in you know, in Shiism, but it's also you know, totally sort of distinct from the, the, the Sunni majority in Tajikistan. And they're in this mountainous region and they speak these distinctive languages that are technically kind of seen as Eastern Iranian languages, but they're very different from Farsi, from Persian, right? Uh, or even from Tajik, which is much, much closer to, you know, to what's spoken in Tehran or Dari in Kabul. So these are, these are really distinctive languages from a particular branch of this family. Uh, in, you know, as is often the case, a mountainous region um, will, will preserve uh, a deeper diversity where every valley is still able to have kind of strong local identities that have resisted uh, while taking in influences have at the same time kind of resisted being, being completely lost. Uh, so, you know, this is now a community that's on the move uh, since the fall of the Soviet Union, since the Tajik Civil War, where the Amiri peoples in their, you know, half dozen different languages were um, you know, often persecuted in various ways. So it's one of the city's newest communities, only several hundred people at this point, speaking at least six different languages. Usnia speaks one of the even smallest of them, Wahi, uh, very distinctive language, but she also speaks, you know, several of the other primary languages. She also speaks Kyrgyz, which is more closely related to Turkish. She also, each level of her life has been in a different language, Tajik for school, then Russian for college and work, English when she came here. Uh, Turkish through, you know, her family and, and, and their sort of diaspora. Uh, so, you know, as, as we do in a few sections of the book, it, it kind of moves between New York and in this case, Tajikistan, as, as it was saying, where, you know, there's certain things that, of course, you have to do sort of back in the home region in terms of recording people and, you know, it's sort of working between places. And uh, we're in this bazaar in, in Horog, which is uh, sometimes called the Paris of, of the Pamir region, because it is sort of this... Uh, the only real kind of city, uh, and uh, it's uh, just an interesting place where, you know, all, all these regional languages are kind of coming into play, but it, it's very distinct from being in Dushanbe, the, the Tajik capital. This is almost like the, the capital of a small kind of uh, area unto itself that really feels very autonomous in a lot of ways. And uh, we're in this 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 bazaar and we're sort of greeting people and we're just kind of uh, you know, mingling and uh, run into somebody, of course, who's... Uh, a uh, Shugni speaker, that's kind of the largest of these Pamiri languages, whose daughter is in New York, it's part of that community, and we're all chatting. And she she thinks she she thinks for a second and she realizes, you know, that 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 uh, we have to go talk to this this bizarre DVD seller who actually had taken, it turns out, unwittingly, a, a recording of ours uh, made in New York with this woman's daughter, the Shugni speaker, had sort of made its way kind of all the way back to this bizarre DVD man and he had burned a DVD out of it as if it were part of an original, you know, kind of compilation. And this is probably somebody in Russia who he gets, gets his sort of from that Pamiri diaspora there. And so we're standing there in this bazaar in the middle of Khorog looking at, he's playing for us our own recording uh, that he had then kind of doctored and was was selling, uh, you know, among the other various sort of cheap DVDs. That, that must have been so, so 
validating, right? As someone doing pretty obscure work in a, in a small, like, you know, small organization. <laughs> it was a it was a special articulation of this sort of the boomerang effect, as it's been called. Some people have called it the pizza effect or the taco effect, which is kind of an interesting kind of gloss on everything we're talking about. So you know, with the with the the idea of the pizza effect, when it's when it's been called that, it's the idea that actually you know nobody would deny that this is a sort of Neapolitan. Neapolitan food in a lot of ways, although the word actually is connected with pide from Turkey and other things around the Mediterranean. But, you know, pizza, as we know it, this is a Neapolitan word. Again, not Italian, wasn't sort of known about in Tuscany, particularly. It was a Neapolitan thing, but it globalizes via New York. Uh, it's in the large movement of, of Neapolitan speakers to the U.S. and especially New York. And, you know, I won't get to into those debates about whether it was Lombardi or the other guy or, you know, who made the first right coal-fired thing and New Haven, we know, is great too and whatever. But basically, you know, we're talking about something which was highly local product having to do with sort of Neapolitan speakers who then through migration come to particular places in the U.S. and New York. And then pizza becomes this, you know, global phenomenon. And that's when it sort of boomerangs back. This is the pizza effect to Italy. So now, you know, after so many people going to Italy and asking for pizza, seems like you can get pizza everywhere in Italy, but it's not Italian, or it's only recently Italian. It's Neapolitan via migration to New York and then boomerang back. So in a way, you know, that those that's it's, it's, it's illustrative of also how these things move. Yeah, yeah, and how technology sort of enables these languages to, to kind of stay alive kind of across great distances. Um, although the technology bit of it is a little complicated, um, how how are the tech platforms aiding or thwarting or like how are they contributing to the preservation of endang endangered languages? The technology question is an interesting one that's obviously still unfolding in many ways. Um, and it's important not to forget that writing itself is a technology, um, really a technology compared to to the oral dimension, which I think you know, oral language is, is really universal or signed language in the case of deaf, deaf villages and deaf communities, but basically oral or signed languages. And there are also whistled languages and drummed languages, but those tend to sort of build on, um, and then those are highly endangered as well. Those tend to build on spoken languages. So really worldwide, you're talking about every community having a uh, spoken or signed language, uh, but writing, again, being really a technology that emerges relatively recently in the history of language into, in, in just a few places. Uh, so technologies, the question of technologies kind of goes back a, a while, but if we're talking of course today about digital technologies and uh, the, the sorts of things that are in the news, um, you know, on the one hand, they're certainly enabling the kind of documentation we do, the kind of field work we just mentioned, uh, you know, has really bloomed partly out of, as a result of the awareness, growing awareness in just the last few decades of language endangerment, but also partly because of uh, better technologies, recording technologies, video technologies, portability of those things, software for linguistic work and so on, which itself is kind of its own interesting story uh, involving both missionaries and academic linguists and language activists. Missionaries are also very involved in this stuff, which is an important aspect. Um, but uh, those have certainly enabled the work of language documentation that we do. We use technology all the time. At the same time, uh, you know, according to one, the best study of this is that has been done, only about 5% of the world's languages are online in a meaningful sense. Uh, so there is, you know, this, this way in which if a language is not sort of commercially important enough, doesn't have enough eyeballs attached to it, I guess, that, that can be sold to, uh, the tech platforms are not really going to do much about it. There's there's a few little initiatives here and there that we've even been kind of you know tied to it at different points. But ultimately, you know, they they sometimes say, oh well, if you know speakers want to sort of do volunteer translation of the platform, Facebook and Google have done this. Oh, if you want to, you know, donate your labor as a speaker, uh, you know, Wikipedia is one of the best. It's obviously a pretty open platform for people. But there's all sorts of things that would have to happen first. Even having a writing system, right? Writing and perhaps a degree of standardization are even part of this this highly written nature of the internet up till now. This is just talking about the, the internet. Uh, and then for the sorts of like automatic translation and AI, they rely on having a certain amount of data and a certain amount of information to even be able to sort of do these things. Uh, so 
so this idea that Google and Facebook are organizing the world's information and connecting the world is is pretty empty when you think about the fact that most of the world's 7,000 languages are not on there. So, you know, many hope to get on there and there's sort of a double-edged sword to it, but uh, technology, you know, it, it remains to be seen. It's not a, it's not a cure-all by any means. Uh, it may right. help in certain ways, but that depends on how it's controlled and shaped. Right. And and also the the speakers themselves play a big role in the influencing these platforms. Um, you mentioned an anecdote about uh, Microsoft facing relentless lobbying from Nico and co speakers of uh, an African language and finally yeah. you know, giving in and, and creating sort of adopting the font um, on their software. Right. So this is of the six stories. This is this is the one that really gets most at this question of writing and technology. Exactly, it's about Ibrahima, uh, who is uh, originally from Guinea, um, speaker of a Manding language. This is a really important group of languages in, across West Africa that have been divided in various ways by colonial borders and even language uh, policies. And um, West Africa, it turns out, has been a hotbed of new writing systems over the last two centuries. Um, and the most successful of them arguably has been UNCO, invented by a guy named Suleiman Kante in the 1940s, and now has sort of tireless advocates like Ibrahima who are going wherever people are migrating to with New York, with its large and growing West African community as one of the epicenters. So, uh, uh, you know, Ibrahima for him, a big part of promoting UNCO has been not just sort of teaching the language and establishing it within the West African diaspora, but getting it into these tech platforms. Uh, and that involves sort of Unicode, that involves Microsoft, all of these guys. Um, so I'm going to jump in for one second and, and ask audience members to submit their questions. Um, I have many, many more, but I don't want to hog all of Ross's time. Uh, so please send us questions. We will try to address them. And in the meantime, um, I will I will keep at it. So um, Ross, there's you are really gung ho about endangered languages, right? You're like a fan. Something you're more ambivalent ambivalent about in the book is this idea that endangered languages do seem to need, or all language does seem to need some kind of container to survive. And, you know, in our world, this container tends to be the state, the nation state. Um, can you kind of walk us through, like, are, are there any alternatives to, like, a territorial state for language to survive? Like, can we think of alternatives um, and what are some of the good ones that you've encountered? Because this is something that is like fundamental and, you know, we're not going to have 7,000 new states overnight. Um, so what do we do if we do need some kind of a home base for language? I've, I've tried to spend a lot of time even just understanding what the structure has been for these languages to, to evolve, what kind of space they have had that has allowed them to be distinct languages because the answer is not just isolation in a valley uh it's 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 more complicated than that I, I i totally agree that there needs to be a space uh for for a language a distinctive way of speaking a distinctive you know set of sounds uh, the whole kind of communicative system to evolve in and and, and grow in um and you know in in sociolinguistics the branch of linguistics that talks about how language functions in society um you know, there's often talk about different domains of language, whether a language is used in the home, whether it's used in a religious space, whether it's used in a sort of workplace, um, what spaces it, it has. And part of looking at language endangerment, I mean, it's it's not just about uh, the population size, because historically there have been many languages which have been even stable with 70 or 80 speakers, uh, and uh, especially in sort of hunter-gatherer societies, which are relatively smaller scale, often a few hundred people, um, a language can be totally stable in terms of intergenerational transmission. And intergenerational transmission is really the, the sort of the key metric around language endangerment. Uh, but this idea of spheres or domains, like where can the language be used is, is critical. And, and, and when there are fewer and fewer domains, when it's going down to sort of just the home, which is often the fundamental one, uh, that, that really reflects greater degrees of endangerment. Um, and so, you know, it's interesting to compare. I mean, there's a lot of ways of thinking about this. One is even just to think about empires versus nation states and actually whether paradoxically empires have been better containers for linguistic diversity. Uh, and the linguistic diversity, I think, is really is, is what I'm passionate about here, because I think it's uh, um, although it's been sort of uh, vilified as Babel, you know, as a place where nobody can understand each other, that's not how linguistic diversity works in my experience or my research. 
actually it, it, what happens is a much more intricate patterning of uh, of ways of of communicating and people find ways through multilingualism and multiperspectivalism to 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 be together and interact together um so you know it's not just a sort of confusion of tongues as that kind of ill-fated little passage of genesis has it it's actually uh something much richer that results and uh, uh you know could be compared to you know the world of biodiversity and has been often uh such that uh you know really what you what we're getting now is more of a monoculture and i think a monoculture actually has serious downsides that we're not really understanding and we think it's all sort of peace and uh commerce but actually a monoculture a linguistic monoculture is really problematic so um you know first i think it's to understand actually empires have in certain ways and perhaps new york functions more as a kind of weird cosmopolis uh, imperial cosmopolis uh i'm really interested to hear what you think about this you know that this uh, this idea of uh you know these sort of and this is not to sort of uh lionize empires which have had so many of their problems but whether new york is actually sort of a successor more to sort of Habsburg Vienna or Ottoman Istanbul uh, or some of these other places that have been more sort of like cosmopolitan entrepots rather than, you know, New York is not the sort of national capital of a nation state exactly. And the United States is not entirely like a nation state, which perhaps has good, zen, good sides and bad sides, right? Uh, but then, so that's that's one discussion. But then I think on a much more local level, it's about locality and the strength of localities and their particular local environments can continue to have sufficient degree of autonomy and strength and ability to sort of self, uh, you know, self-regulate and, and develop their own kind of cultural and linguistic futures. And I think that's possible without or within the nation state. There are some nation states that are trying to allow for this in certain ways. We could talk about comparative language policy across different places. Uh, but uh, what has to be really resisted, I think, is the sort of... Uh, monocultural nation state especially yeah um we have a really interesting question from cam kidia um which i'm gonna preface with a little anecdote so i have two little kids and before they were born i was thinking what what language am i going to speak to them in because i grew up speaking armenian and russian and i lost the armenian and now my russian is like gotten to the point where it's basically Yiddish because it's so bastardized by other languages. And so I thought, well, if I speak to my kids in That's Russian, a good point. That's a good point. <laughs> and they're not as Jewish, they're going to speak some kind of Yiddish that nobody understands. It's very weird. So we we settled on French. Fine. It's going really well. Um, but but to Cam's question, how much and how well do you have to speak another language to be able to ethically put it in discourse? And what are the moral arguments for or against doing so in English? Wow, thank you, thank you, Cam. Yeah, it's uh, well, every language community kind of seems to think about these things a little bit differently, and that also kind of inheres in the particular histories of those language communities. Uh, you know, there are certainly some for which speaking, I mean, speaking speaking a language is there. There are differences here between sort of languages of wider communication that have been learned and are spoken by large numbers of people as a second or third language versus versus with many of the languages that, that that we're talking about or that we're researching and involved in um you know it, it really reflects the time spent in a community it really reflect, reflects an identity there is almost nobody who speaks that language who is not clearly a member of that community uh and that doesn't mean it's a totally closed circuit but uh you know in many places many parts of the world you know language is, is an index of time spent with people in the book it's about it's about belonging in a place you wouldn't know it you, you can't know it from books you can't learn it as a polyglot online through duolingo you learn it because you've had some serious and deep connection with a community in a place for a long time and that's what's that's what's involved in it uh and so i think it's important not to treat languages just as codes or to think that ai is just going to sort of know these languages uh you know with with larger languages in some cases that have already kind of been through a kind of uh massification process where they're there they are you know just kind of out there for people to sort of pick up as almost a kind of uh currency uh it can be it can be a little different but um you know there are also different very different forms of speakerhood uh which should be talked about and even the question of native speaker is that that even that category is not a straightforward one that that that, that is beyond all question uh 
Uh, and increasingly, because of language shift and language endangerment, there there is there are many people who are essentially, you know, Sami speakers, heritage speakers, rememberers, um, and there is a whole world now of kind of post vernacular usage, symbolic linguistic usage, which uh, can be very meaningful for people and uh, is an aspect of language revitalization that we talk about. I, I talk about in the book, uh, you know, with with Lenape and other situations where actually there's you know a shrinking pool. Uh, of if any sort of people who really learned like these languages as, as children and now kind of a large world of people who know some or want to acknowledge it or want to use it for prayer or ritual or other things. So, you know, I guess I would encourage uh, encourage people to look whether it's at their sort of linguistic background or connections or the communities to which they're connected or want to be connected uh, at the sort of different levels of speakerhood that they could sort of attune themselves to and then to sort of honestly reflect themselves in uh, and certainly not to kind of hold up uh, some some sort of horizon of absolute fluency or nativity, which is often unrealistic, or it's not even part of uh, you know what speaker necessarily has to mean in different in different communities. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know exactly in terms of English. I'm not sure exactly what that, uh, but I, I think English would be the same as 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 with as with anything. And English has become a language where you know the majority of people and speakers users are. Are, would not necessarily have spoken or used it as, um, uh, you know, as children. And actually, we need to be much more sort of open to this. May be something with the next project for me, but to the world of English is English is really not a single entity, and it, it sort of needs to be broken up. Uh, but that's that's another conversation. Yeah, um, I had a question about a, a particular use of English. So in Singapore, there's something known as Singlish, and it's like very organic, and it sort of came about. Uh, just with people living and talking and, and doing things, but the government really doesn't like it. And for a long time, they were trying to crack down and try to have people speak the Queen's English. Um, mm -hmm. Failed, absolutely failed. People speak Singlish all the time. And it's it's just really interesting how these two forces are, you know, working against each other, even in like a pretty authoritarian setting, right? The state has tried so many times and they cannot get rid of Singlish. Um, so- Yeah, Singapore is a fascinating one. Yeah. Um, we have a couple of questions about um, kids and education. So uh, Anonymous asks, um, says many children of immigrants and folks not from mainland U.S. were not taught their parents' mother tongue in the 90s and early 2000s. Are we broadly seeing a change? And related question um, from Leslie Villegas, did you, do you have a sense of how the education system in New York approaches the educational needs of school-aged children in these linguistically diverse communities? And I think that's something we're seeing play out every day with, with so many new arrivals um, from south of the border as well, as well as other countries. Yeah, there's so much, there's so much to these questions. Um, it's, you know, on the one hand, the benefits of bilingual education have, have only really been kind of recognized and are still only kind of being recognized just in the last few decades on a wider scale with enough evidence. There, there was a, a, a mentality even until relatively recently that, you know, that you people's kids needed to be sort of pushed into English or the other majority language as quickly as possible, that the other language would somehow negatively affect them. And now it's seen that there are many educational and cognitive and other benefits to bi or multilingualism to the point where it's actually, of course, become even fashionable. Uh, and there is something of a so-called bilingual revolution in the schools, which for which New York is a kind of ground zero. And I talk about a little bit in the book, there are uh, bilingual education programs of one kind or another in 13 different languages now, of course, largest number in Spanish. The French government has gotten very involved in promoting these, especially in New York, where there's also um, kind of friendly legislation towards it. Um, but there are also programs in Haitian Creole and in you know, Polish and in, and in Urdu and so on. Uh, and so it's actually quite an exciting moment. I mean, there was until the 1960s uh, when uh, especially kind of Chinese activists on the West Coast and Korean activists in New York sort of began to, to, to bolster bilingual education and demand bilingual education. Uh, there was really nothing of the kind uh, at a formal level. Of course, there were all kinds of sort of Sunday schools or other things that communities tried to do, but um, it's an exciting moment. But at the same time, implementation and what it actually means uh, and, and having it not just be sort of transitional, uh, but sort of additive, not subtractive. Uh, and this is supposed to be the idea of dual language education, that it's more balanced and that both of these things are there. Uh, and this is happening in other places too. I mean, 
you know, the Hawaiian language revitalization movement, which has been an extraordinary one, has been very much education centered. The Irish language schools in Ireland are a major vector for uh, bolstering Irish. Uh, so education, you know, now that we depend so much on the state with mandatory public education has kind of, or mandatory uh, education has, has, uh, has really uh, made this happen. Uh, you know, we look to the schools, language activists increasingly look to the schools to, to be involved in these things because, you know, sort of traditional ways of education have been, have already been sort of swept away. So it, it, it in many ways does depend on schools, but then schools, they, they need teachers, they have, you know, who will speak the languages, they need textbooks and they have their sort of standards and political things that are pulling at them. So you know, how these things are actually playing out and whether it really make us a more sort of deeply multilingual country uh, where it's sustained and we don't go through that sort of three generation immigrant pattern, uh, which sometimes even speeds up now. And it's, you know, where, where language loss proceeds basically just within a few generations and few communities are able to hold on to their language. That has been the norm. And that's the sense in which I describe New York and, and other cities as like sieves that the languages are running through. They're coming here. They're, they, these are abilities, knowledge, but they're just sort of being lost. Uh, and there's the idea that, that they'll be sort of replenished somehow by new immigration, but we can't count on that. The homelands and the homelands itself, themselves, there's more language endangerment. Um, but uh, I think even now, just recently, Trump has started to, I don't know whether he got a copy of Language City or, or not, but he has been talking just in the last week or so about so-called truly foreign languages, languages coming into our country. And then he referred specifically most recently to languages in New York City schools that nobody knows, nobody speaks, nobody teaches. And I assume he's referring to the kind of deep linguistic diversity that I talk about in the book. And, uh, you know, it's an interesting new kind of uh, line for, for him. I mean, he's actually quite, quite right that we don't have the capacity we should for interpretation and teaching of many of the languages that are coming, including in the, the so-called migrant crisis that's been unfolding in New York just in the last couple of years. Um, and that, you know, languages, indigenous languages of the Americas, in particular African languages, uh, you know, and, and, and others are continuing to come in large numbers and we're not really prepared for it in various ways, but it is an extraordinary opportunity. Uh, so, you know, it's a great challenge for the schools, absolutely. Uh, and nobody denies the importance of, of English as a lingua franca, and then Spanish, Bengali, Russian, and so on as lingua franca is also at there in 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 in, in those communities in in certain neighborhoods. Uh, but uh, but we really have not quite found a way to sort of uh, knit together a linguistic ecology that actually sort of builds on and takes advantage of and does justice to all the linguistic diversity that people are are bringing and the education system has to be a big part of that. Yeah. Well, your comments about Trump, who is definitely reading Language City, <laughs> made me wonder if if Baron Trump knows Slovenian, right? It wouldn't be out of the it wouldn't be inconceivable um, for his Trump's mother. Trump's mother spoke Scottish Gaelic growing up apparently. Uh, she was I think from the outer Hebrides, a pretty obscure area, but, uh, but I guess lost it in New York. Yeah. 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 Um, so maybe he's reeling from the sense of loss uh, about that. <laughs> right, right. Um, Anonymous has a question about the unique nature of languages spoken in New York for generations. How do you approach translation slash interpretation with a New York specific dialect? I, I'm not sure if this question is talking about like New Yorkese kind of patois mixes or or something else, but maybe maybe you can give it a I think there are a few things to kind of mention there. Certainly, you know, this idea of New York City English, which is really a, its own fascinating question and is, is, is really seen as a bundle of ethnolects, uh, is interesting unto itself. I mean, it's an example of a highly stigmatized variety of English, which itself is, is perhaps endangered and most carried on in some cases by immigrants. Um, and, and of course, I, I also meant to mention within all of this, the sort of changes in thinking about assimilation, what assimilation is. Uh, and older sort of straight line theories of assimilation, whether that needs to be the model or what the, the, the other models of uh, of immigration and arrival here are, but um, and, and the degree of diversity of communities that can exist within this polity. Um, but uh, you know there are mixed languages in a sense which have also are arising in New York, and I talk about some of them in the book. Uh, you know, the, the best known that has been kind of put under a label, of course, is Spanglish, 
uh, but there are, which looks very different, what that means in California versus New York. In New York, the way it, it often is this kind of New Yorkian variety, which combines Rican or Dominican Spanish with local forms of English, African American English, all kinds of things going on. Um, similarly, in the Himalayan community, I talk about this, this, this new kind of mixed language called Ramaluk. And, and it, it doesn't quite make sense to call it like a thing so much as to sort of identify the, the types of what's been called translanguaging. The, uh, the the types of kind of not just code switching but sort of mixing and sort of transit that's happening within between languages, uh, and it's true that these are really very little is known about them. They're highly dynamic. It's not clear to what extent they will be sort of passed on. Some have talked about Runglish in Brighton Beach, sort of how Russian and English kind of uh, mix together. Uh, and uh, Ophelia Garcia is a scholar in New York who has done a lot of her work, especially in the education system, about trying to find ways that, that bilingual and multilingual education can honor the, these forms of mixing. But perhaps yet another just last piece to kind of bring to, to that question also is about, you know, what languages are being maintained in New York. And uh, this is part of why the story of Yiddish is, 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 is in the book, because in some ways it's, it's not an endangered language, actually, and it's one of the larger ones among the six that I talk about. Uh, but, um, you know, what's, what's, what's part of what's intriguing here is that uh, the language is being kind of revitalized and reborn in, in Hasidic Brooklyn. And the Hasidic community in particular has forged almost a kind of new or distinctive variety of Yiddish, uh, while, while other forms are, have been endangered or lost, really, you know, beginning with the, the Holocaust and then a sort of a massive loss of Yiddish speakers worldwide. Uh, as the Hasidic, global Hasidic community has re been reborn with Brooklyn as its kind of base, um, it's actually sort of bringing that language into the fourth or fifth generation, partly through a system of yeshivas, which are separate from the public school system and other institutions. So I also wanted to document that. And other communities, likewise, you know, have actually found New York to be sort of their last, the last bastion for their, for their language. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, again, not clear that the, the public education system can necessarily provide too much space for those efforts, but it's extraordinary nonetheless, and it's 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 part of the book and part of the story about actually New York need not be or cities need not be sort of graveyards for languages, but it can actually be greenhouses in some sense. Yeah. Um, so we have less than ten minutes left. Um, I have a quick quickie from anonymous. Have you thought of offering New York City language tours through ELA? We have run some tours, uh, combining language and food, uh, Himalayan Queens, Jewish languages in Brooklyn, uh, languages of, of Astoria, which are you know, from the Eastern Mediterranean, North Africa, and so on. Uh, I teach linguistics at uh, Columbia as well, and I take my students usually, uh, of course, I've been teaching for a number of years, it's called Endangered Languages in a Global City. We usually get out into the streets and go around with speakers and uh, and eat and, and so on. So. Um, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's something that, uh, that that we do occasionally. It's you know to do it well, we're not finding it to be a great major kind of commercial venture. More of something that is just a, a lot of fun to get out there sometimes. And and uh, the language map is also kind of designed for people to be able to see their own location and to sort of t take themselves around the city and walk around Jackson Heights or anywhere. It, it's really not just Queens, but Queens, of course, is in some ways the, the epicenter and uh, has become justly famous for being, you know, the most linguistically diverse part of the most linguistically diverse city in the history of the world. Um, so, you know, tourism is a, is a double-edged sword, obviously, and, uh, you know, what that what that looks like. But I do think this is one of the sort of, uh, um, one of the most kind of distinctive and important aspects of, of, of New York, and again, indeed, of other cities too, London, Los Angeles, Chicago, but also Johannesburg, Port Moresby, uh, many others, uh, that whatever, you know, hopefully there will be ways for people to sort of appreciate here, to bring it within earshot uh, in ways that will then make them sort of advocates or more appreciative um, uh, in ways that will hopefully shape policy and uh, that will also kind of uh, uh, give more space for these languages. So uh, I do hope that people will sort of read the book and then, you know, we, we may have an occasional tour to look out for our events, but uh, but also sort of walk around the city to a language as well between the map and the book and sort of hopefully hear and see the city in a different way. But it goes beyond the signage. And, you know, again, the restaurants have these sort of national labels. You got to talk to people and got to uh, sort of dig under through the lens of language.
Yeah, and and this last uh, question and, and your answer um, reminded me of a really good point you make in the book, which is that global quote unquote global cities love to brag about how you can get the best Thai food and you can you know see Chinese dance and what have you. But it works both ways. Like cities have to enable and invest and sort of foster these communities, um, as well as just using them as a as a marketing you know line. Yeah. Yeah, I've started to see it. I, I saw Street Easy advertising on the subway saying, you know, live in Queens among all the languages. And I've seen some nascent efforts to kind of encourage tourists to New York to go to Queens and to go yes. to multilingual areas and nice. kind of not good, but there's, you yeah. know, it's not just a sort of asset to be taken advantage of. It's uh, people's actual languages and lives. So how yeah. do we kind of square that circle? And we didn't talk about immigration at all, and we could talk about it for another hour, but um, something that also struck me looking at these networks that bring speakers of these languages to New York is, um, you know, it's so vulnerable um, to immigration policy, to whatever's going on at the border. And, uh, you know, it, we have special visas for religious workers, for example, but not for speakers of, of um, endangered languages. And that's also a form of culture and, and really important to people. So. Mm. Anyway, maybe that's something for ELA to, to it's an intriguing, add. That's an, yeah. that's an intriguing, yeah, yeah. I mean, we think about all the types of skills. I mean, the knowledge that it's not just the languages, it's the musics, it's the poetry, it's the, the wisdom and the knowledge that people are bringing as well. Uh, and I guess, you know, one way that I, uh, you have to, if you haven't already read uh, The Cosmopolites, uh, his first book, and then the next book is coming out uh, just in October. I'm really excited about it. Yeah, the, the, there's a sort of, there's such an interesting kind of, I think, contrast and, and a comparison to be made here about these sort of unequal mobilities. Who can move where, how today? And, you know, Tusa has traced how elites are able to now move around the world, get citizenships from everywhere, um, while the future of immigration here uh, and, and, and New York as the place which has had this now most continually probably of any place in the world for now four centuries, uh, that future hangs in the balance with this with this election now on the 100th anniversary of the 1924 Immigration Act that closed America's borders for four decades and nearly sort of choked off the city in various ways. So we stand in a really, really precarious moment of what I talk about at the end might, you know, end up being peak diversity for various reasons that both the languages themselves, the people who speak who speak them, ultimately the city and the way it functions and cities more generally. Um, you know, we don't know what the future holds, but it's it's a it's a moment. I was I felt impelled to sort of do this now to to, to capture this moment because it's uh, as much as we're now trying to be involved. You know, we, we don't know what will happen next. Yeah. So what you can do is you can buy Ross's book. You can support ELA, vote in the fall, and um, open your ears because that's kind of the first step to realizing the amazing city that's around the, those of us who are in New York. Um, Thanks everyone for being here. Thank you, Ross, for writing this book, for answering all of our questions. And um, yeah, see you all, see you all next time.